Hi, everyone. After just a day of deliberations, the three men convicted in the murder of Ahmad Arbery, the jury followed the facts and law carefully, just as they did in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. So how about we just appreciate our jury system and jurors for a moment, rather than constantly being told it doesn't work. But first, many of us traveling for the holiday will need vaccination cards to get into restaurants, bars, sports stadiums, and other public places. But some will be using fake cards. Yes, many thousands have purchased these counterfeits. In fact, anyone with an iPhone can order one in a matter of seconds. So where do people get them? Well, an example that made national headlines was the plot from Instagram influencer Jasmine Clifford. She sold fake vaccine cards through her Instagram. She allegedly sold around 250 cards in the New York area. Some of her customers were even frontline workers in hospitals and nursing homes. Clifford charged 250 bucks per card. She didn't stop there for another 250. She could actually get you on New York State's official database. And fraudsters are selling blank or forged versions of the cards over e-commerce sites, including eBay and Etsy. We reached out to both of them, haven't received a response. But the issue is a booming one on the dark web's encrypted messaging app, Telegram. Platforms used worldwide by over 400 million people. The sales there are skyrocketing after President Biden's September 9th vaccine mandate. Take a look at some of the numbers. From August 10th to September 10th, the price for a vaccine, a fake vaccine card doubled. The number of sellers went from 1,000 to 10,000. This has become a big issue in the sports world as well. Last week, a new report that Tampa Bay Bucks wide receiver Antonio Brown obtained a fake vaccine card. It's according to Brown's former live-in chef and assistant, Stephen Ruiz. The leaked text messages show that Brown's girlfriend asking Ruiz for two cards listing the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for them both. Ruiz said he could not obtain the cards, but confirmed Brown got them from another player who was selling them. Ruiz declined to say who that player was. The Buccaneers head coach Bruce Arians saying this week the team did their, quote, due diligence, and he has no reason to believe that this was a fake card. Then there's the NHL, San Jose Sharks forward Evander Kane, currently serving a 21-game suspension for submitting a fake vaccine card. Kane released a statement apologizing. And some others have actually been prosecuted. Joining us now is Brian Linder, an emerging threats expert for Checkpoint Research. He's part of a team of 200 researchers whose entire focus is watching for trends on vaccine, fake vaccine cards. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. So how pervasive is this? It's extremely pervasive, Dan. I mean, we, we have seen the trends em emerge from a early days of the availability of the vaccine where, um, you know, again, in a darker area of the Internet called dark web, uh, where a lot of people don't frequent, you could get in there and maybe conduct a transaction illegally to obtain one of these cards. But what happened around the August time frame is these availability of these vaccine cards online moved around into the consumer internet, sites that you might visit, and a social media platform called Telegram, which you mentioned. And Telegram is used, again, by hundreds of millions of people around the world, and we saw an explosion of interest by people and also the number of sellers, as you mentioned, to get these cards into the hands of people that wanted them. So there, there's a huge consumer, consumerization of these fake vaccine card sales, so, and it's actually presenting a major public health crisis for us. Well, how hard or easy is it to spot one of the fakes? It can be very difficult. In many cases, the fake fa the vaccine cards themselves are imaged in some app. For example, in the New York City, there's a there's a an app that one can use to digitally photograph their their vaccine card. Or said differently, when one presents a vaccine card at the door of a bar or an entertainment <clears throat> venue, right. how closely are they going to look at it? So it's very difficult to tell in many cases. Right. And so I, I wonder, you know, are many people just making these at home? Because as you point out. It's not like when I was underage in San Diego and using a fake ID to get in and it was the toughest place in the country to get in with a fake ID and they sat there putting a, uh, a light on it to see everything about it and they're checking it and, and, and busting me. Um, no, It's not, not like all. that. <laughs> No, in fact, they'll have the opposite incentive, right? They'll want to get you in. They want to serve you. They want, they want you in there. So what motivation would a bar owner really have to stop people from coming in? So, no, you won't see the you know, flashlights and infrared 
Um, and it, on top of that, people can do it at home, you know, maybe on a printer in Photoshop, but many people don't have the skills to do that. Therefore, there is a demand for it, and that's why we see such an emergence of it online. So are people being prosecuted? I mean, I'm reading about a, you know, a few cases out there where there have been prosecutions of people. You know, I have a case here about a woman uh, in Hawaii uh, who used a, a fake card who's been um, uh, arrested and actually is being held currently without bail. Um, have there been a lot of cases where people have been prosecuted? Only in bits and pieces, right? So, the, you know, the, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and other authorities struggle with it, disrupting this at any scale. So they'll make some examples of people, which they have done, as you've, as you've correctly pointed out. But will that make any difference? And will we see the kind of disruption where, you know, huge rackets of fake vaccine providers will be disrupted? I don't think so. I think there's just too many sellers, too many outlets for them. So you will see examples made. It is an illegal activity without a doubt. But can law enforcement really get ahead of it? So I think in, you see it now, a steady stream of stories about EMS workers that were allegedly helping create these cards or restaurant owners or, you know, and, and, and all kinds of mechanisms. Of course, nothing at scale like we have seen in on Telegram where so many people are involved with and interested in. So we're not talking about one or two or ten. We're talking about thousands of people selling and thousands of people interested in it. Is the issue that there just isn't the appetite on the part of law enforcement to go after these people in a major way? I mean, again, you know, I'm not interested in having anyone prosecute someone, you know, who's using a fake card, right? I mean, you know, they shouldn't do it. It's bad, et cetera. But what about the people who are selling them en masse? I mean, why aren't there more efforts to track these people down and prosecute them? First reason is the way that, that transactions are conducted make it very hard for law enforcement to get their arms around it. Number one, if it's being done on a social media platform like Telegram, it's very hard to identify the source, the seller. They can disguise themselves. Second thing is that the transactions are being done with cryptocurrency, so it's very hard to trace. Thirdly, I don't think law enforcement has the scale of expertise. There's just not enough people that know how to go about you know, attacking the, the digital platform of sale. To, uh, to make it worth their time. There are bigger problems in cybersecurity that, that are, uh, you know, obviously pipelines being encrypted by ransomware and things. So I just don't think there's enough, enough resources available to do it. Finally, what did you make of in the Antonio Brown uh, case, the, uh, the Buccaneers uh, receiver, where the coach said they did their due diligence? Any, any idea what that means? Yeah, so in that case, you know, whether he had a fake, I'll reserve opinion, I didn't see the card and, you know, but... You know, the, the receiver of that card, which is the, the, the team sports unit, may have looked at it as a bar owner would have looked at it. They probably, it looked legit. They didn't question it. Or maybe there was a bigger story. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say they looked at it and it looked legitimate because it's not hard to counterfeit a card. Of course, the deeper meaning or the deeper representation of that is that, uh, you know, someone that doesn't want to get a vaccine card, it shouldn't be that easy to get through it. But I don't, I don't necessarily blame the team for that. Um, it's a very difficult thing. There is a, a larger issue, and that is why don't we have a federally mandated digital vaccine passport system so that truly it'd be digitally verifiable? That doesn't exist in the United States right now on the federal level, so that's probably the bigger problem, but definitely a controversial story. Yeah. Brian Linder, thank you. Appreciate it. Interesting Thanks, stuff. Dan. Have a great day. Thanks. Coming up, the three men charged with killing Ahmad Arbery have been found guilty of murder. It sure seems it was a pretty easy decision for the jury. In the wake of this and the Kyle Rittenhouse cases, rather than attacking our jurors and our juries as biased and unfair, shouldn't we be thankful that our system worked in both cases? Up next. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, guilty. 
Today, guilty verdicts came down for all three defendants in the Ahmad Arbery murder trial. Travis Michael, who fired the fatal shots, found guilty of all nine counts, including malice murder, the highest form of murder allowed in this case. His father, Gregory Michael, found guilty of eight of the nine counts, only being acquitted on that malice murder charge. He was convicted of four counts of felony murder. Felony murder means you can be charged with murder just for having the intent to commit a felony and that it results in someone's death. Meanwhile, William Roddy Bryan, who recorded the killing and helped block Arbery in with the McMichaels, was found guilty on six of the nine counts, including three counts of felony murder. He was not convicted of malice murder. He was not convicted of one count of felony murder related to an aggravated assault. In other words, the jury found the shooter most culpable, the guy who initiated the chase second most culpable, and the guy who was in the car behind third. The jurors clearly did not want to convict Brian for aggravated assault with a firearm because he had nothing to do with the firearm that was bought, brought or used. The whole verdict actually makes perfect sense based on the facts and evidence. This was a fairly straightforward case, and the jurors decided it pretty quickly. High-profile case, three defendants facing nine charges each. They came to three separate verdicts after a little more than a day of deliberations. It says to me there probably was not a lot of dissension among the jurors. After the verdict was read, lead prosecutor Linda Donikoski said this. The verdict today was a verdict based on the facts. Yes. Based on the evidence. Yes. And that was our goal, was to yes. bring that to that jury so That's that right. they could do the right did. thing. Because the jury system works in this country. Mm -hmm. And when you present the truth to people and they Come can on. see it, Right. They will do the right thing. Sure that's and right. that's what Come this jury did today right. in getting justice for Ahmaud Arbery. Even Travis Michael's attorneys expressed appreciation for the jury and the jury system. This is a very difficult day for Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael. Uh, these are two men who honestly believe that what they were doing was the right thing to do. However, a Glenn County jury has spoken they have found them guilty, and they will be sentenced. And that is a very disappointing and sad verdict for myself and for Bob and for our team. But we also recognize that this is a day of celebration for the Arbery family. We cannot tear our eyes away from the way that they feel about this. And we understand that they feel they have gotten justice today. We respect that. We honor that because we honor this jury trial system. Good for them. That's more than I can say for those who criticized and or undermined the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, including much of the left-leaning media and even the president and vice president of the United States. The takeaway for me from both verdicts is that the system worked. The jurors in both cases were asked to make legal decisions, not moral ones, and they did it diligently. I mean, tonight I was just watching on MSNBC on Joy Reid's program. They're going off, not just about the Arbery case and the jury system working, but about how horrible the Rittenhouse verdict was last Friday and about how the jury system doesn't work. Looking back at both these cases, rather than more outrage and stone throwing, why can't we just appreciate that the jury system worked in both cases? They followed the law, came to maybe the only verdict that objective, reasonable jurors would have come to. I'm grateful for it. Joining us now are Michael J. Moore, former U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Georgia, and Judge Glenda Hatchett is back with us, former chief presiding judge of the Fulton County, Georgia Juvenile Court and founding partner of Atlanta's The Hatchett Firm. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, let me start with you, Judge Hatchett. Do you agree with my assessment that it's time to sort of say we're grateful that the jury system is working in both cases, or do you disagree with me? Well, I think that you have to take it case by case, Dan. I do agree that and a lot of people were very critical of what happened in the Rittenhouse case. But the truth is, I followed that case very closely. The prosecution did not meet the burden of, of proving right. beyond a reasonable doubt. And there was a lot of high emotions in that case on both sides. But I do not read that the, the decision was incorrect on that case. And I've been criticized by that, but I stand by what I said. And I also think that today's verdict was exactly what it should have been. But let me just say again, I think that there has been so much distrust. And I think we have to acknowledge that. 
particularly among black and brown people in this country, because we have seen so many other situations where justice was not done. Yep. And in this case, frankly, if there had been um, what the people wanted to do on the ground there initially, and we have a DA who's really been already prosecuted and, I mean, and indicted, then this case would have never seen what we yep. saw today. And so I yep. think no. we have to take Look, yeah. I, I, I get that. And I, I think it's a really important context you just provided. But the first thing you said to me is the, the one that's the today and the now, which is that is a legal matter. Both verdicts were correct as a legal matter. You're not making a judgment morally. And, 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 and I understand the distrust. My concern is after the fact to continue attacking the verdict from people who really, I don't think, watch the case. But I want to, I do want to focus more on Arbery today. And, and Michael right. J. Moore, you know, I, I want to ask you, a lot of people are saying to me, you've got all these different counts. The guy, the, the, Ahmed Arbery was shot um, by one person with three shots, and yet you have four felony murder counts, another malice murder count. The question I'm getting a lot is, how do you get convicted of so many murder charges in connection with one person's death. Yeah, well, it's good to be with you and good to see you, Judge, uh, too. Um, Dan, it, Georgia law allows for the uh, a murder charge, a felony murder charge, to be imposed any time a murder happens or a death happens during the commission of a felony. So in this case, you had several different felonies uh, that would be applicable, uh, whether that's the false imprisonment, whether that's aggravated assault, those things that uh, would have applied. Those charges will merge together, so it won't be like the defendants receive separate life sentences for each uh, charge. Um, but it allows the, the prosecutor, uh, when they present the case to the grand jury, to ask the grand jury to find that probable cause for these offenses occurred. And then it allows them to offer their proof to the trial jury, and they have the chance to then prove beyond a reasonable doubt each felony, which they allege then resulted uh, in the murder. And so it, it's it's a way to sort of cover their bases, I guess, if, if you will. But again, um, the charges will merge together. It won't be separate, separate uh, uh, yep. individual life sentences, stack, 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 typically. I mean, they'd right. be separate charges, but they'd be, they each call for a life sentence. And, and, and Judge Hatchett, the, the prosecutor saying that she's gonna be asking for life without parole. Now, parole, there is parole eligibility here for these charges. There could be parole after, let's say, 30 years, et cetera. Do you think that the judge in this case is likely to grant the prosecution's request of life without parole? It's going to be interesting. I think there's a distinct possibility, uh, particularly with Travis McMichael um, in that situation, because he was found guilty on all of them, including the malice murders count. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with with um, Rody uh, again, I was surprised a little bit, frankly, Dan. We've talked about this before. Uh, I thought that Joy might have been a little bit more lenient on him, but um, I think it, the overall justice is served. It's going to be very interesting. The sentence, and it may well be that the judge actually says, "You know, I'm going to send a strong signal. This is not appropriate, and I am going to sentence them to life." In prison without parole. But let me just also yeah. say as an important footnote that this case really triggered a radical reform in Georgia. And I know that Attorney Moore will certainly not on this one, that had not this been this case, we would not see such a radical change in no. this citizen's arrest um, statute yeah, I mean, look. in Georgia, nor would we see, I think, a hate crime. A statue having been passed in Georgia, which I and, think are important steps in the right direction. And, and, and I should also say that it, this kind of absurd citizen's arrest statute still exists in a lot of states. So it, it's sort of and nuts, the idea. Her. Right. So, so, you know, it's time to get rid of these, you know, the, this kind of citizen's arrest law. You want to create something where, for example, a shopkeeper or a store owner or somebody can have certain rights. That's fine. But the notion that sort of any random individual can go and arrest. But I, I got to ask Michael Moore uh, on the sentencing question, what do you make of that in terms of life without parole? 
you know, the the murder sentence itself will carry a minimum of 30 years before any defendant's eligible for parole. And I think the judge is going to take that into account. I think the judge will likely see the two older gentlemen, that being uh, Mr. Bryan and Mr. McMichael Sr. Uh, and and uh, I think probably you'll see a sentence with parole granted on those. I think he'll try to send a different message, obviously, with Travis McMichael, and that is because he pulled the trigger. It allows him to say, this is our killer. You know, this one, uh, the jury spoke and said you were convicted of malice murder. Uh, and so, you know, I'm going to sentence you a little harsher than, than the other individual. So I, I think you'll likely see without parole for the shooter and, and likely uh, with parole uh, for the other two. But as you mentioned, based on the ages, that could in effect mean they all die in prison. So it does. I mean, see. it's. Yeah, yep. it's essentially, it means a life sentence uh, when you have defendants yep. of that age. And so that's, yep. that's what we're facing. Judge Hatchett and Michael J. Moore, as always, thanks to both of you for all of your help on this case. We look forward to having you back on the next one. Great to be with you. Happy holidays to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy <laughs> Thanksgiving. Coming up, Thank news networks overusing the term breaking news is, well, old news. But one MSNBC show has taken it to an absurd extreme to see what I mean up next. Time now for our Mediaite moments where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Cable news programmers have long been unashamed to claim that everything is breaking news. Not just news, but breaking news. To make you, the viewers, think that something big just happened, or at least in the past couple of hours or so. They, we, are all probably guilty of some form of it. But there may be no show that takes more license with that than the MSNBC program Deadline with Nicole Wallace. The producers of this show don't just try to make old news feel breaking, but instead take opinion on any topic and label it as breaking news, usually critiques of Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Take, for example, this breaking news banner, the Trumpification of the Republican Party. Now, that's not a surprising topic for the show, but it's not breaking news. Neither is breaking news, the impact of Trump's big lie, or breaking news, Trump's campaign to remake the GOP and his image deepens. Remaking a party in one's image isn't breaking news. It's not even news. It's an observation or opinion. It's not even breaking opinion. Now, look, these on-screen banners aren't limited to Trump. They sometimes feature breaking news of a confused type, like breaking news, the gap between reality and perception of reality. Again, how is it breaking news to paint an allegedly confused electorate? And of course, cable news is right with authors promoting their tell-all books. Nicole Wallace did an interview with former Hillary Clinton aide Huma Abedin. The banner read, breaking news, Huma Abedin opens up on Anthony Weiner's sex scandal, except that was not the first or even second or third interview that Aberdeen had done in her book. It was the sixth, yes, sixth interview on MSNBC. Look, chirons or on-air graphics are an essential part of letting the viewer know what's being discussed. We obviously use them, as you can see here on this show. But it's also just a lie to claim all of this is breaking news. It's an effort to deceive you, the viewer. And yet no one seems to want to call it out or stop it. That's our wrap of the day's media bias buzz in the bull. Coming up. All right, all right, all right. From Hollywood A-lister to governor of the great state of Texas, a new poll says actor Matthew McConaughey has more than just a shot. Why Greg Abbott and Beto O'Rourke should be quaking in their boots. Up next. Matthew McConaughey actually could become the governor of Texas. A new poll says that the True Detective star has more than a real shot at running the Lone Star State. Check out these numbers. From the University of Texas and Dallas Morning News, the poll shows McConaughey up by eight points over Governor Greg Abbott in a hypothetical head-to-head -head matchup. 43% of voters would back the actor. 35% would back the incumbent. And McConaughey fared even better when pitted against former Democratic Congressman Beto O'Rourke who just threw his hat in the ring in a head-on matchup with O'Rourke. The actor got 49% compared to the ex-congressman's 27%.
No doubt about it, those numbers are all right, all right, all right. But the question is, are they real? Can Matthew McConaughey, who's been flirting with a run for much of the year, can he really pull it off? There is reason to believe that he can. Insurgent candidates are not new to Texas elections. In 2006, Kink, singer Kinky Friedman and another third-party candidate, Carol Keaton Strayhorn, combined to get a nearly a third of the vote in the governor's race. But neither they nor Democrat Chris Bell could top Rick Perry's 39% to win the state house. McConaughey obviously is a far bigger star than Kinky Friedman. Think more Schwarzenegger than Friedman. Now, if he were to somehow win, how would he govern? Well, he's not just another Hollywood liberal. Listen to what he told the New York Times back in October. Such a great time, a necessary time, I think, to be aggressively centrist. And this, this friend of mine is very smart, Southern boy, goes, yeah, you know, in that middle of the road stuff, ain't nothing in the middle of the road, but uh, yellow lines and armadillos. <laughs> and I was like, hey, bud, <laughs> well, I'm over here in the middle of the road right now, I'm walking these yellow lines and the armadillos are running free. You know why? Because the left and right traffic is so far to the edge, their tires are not even on the pavement, <laughs> you know? So you so, should be in the center. They're not even there. They're not riding the road is what you're saying. No, no, not riding the road of democracy. I don't believe. An ideology seems to make some sense. Aggressive centrism. And the Lone Star State, it might be a winning ideology. Earlier, I spoke with Brendan Steinhauser, Republican strategist based in Austin and a longtime observer of Texas politics. <laughs> Brandon, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. So this McConaughey thing, is it real? I think it is real, Dan. Uh, you know, I said this a few weeks ago. I said people need to really take him more seriously. He has a positive name ID in Texas, obviously a long time uh, following from his television work. He's done a lot of philanthropic work throughout the years. And I think it's, a, it's the real deal. I think Matt McConaughey is seriously considering a run for governor of Texas. Now, we've talked about sort of how he would do the versus Abbott or, or versus uh, Beto. But the dynamics here are a little tricky because take a look at these numbers from the University of Texas poll in a three-way race between Abbott, McConaughey, and Beto O'Rourke. Abbott would prevail with 37%. McConaughey in that situation post 27, O'Rourke has 26. And that suggests that the third party route might be tough for Matthew McConaughey so do you think he's going to pursue the independent route? Might he try and run as a Democrat? Yeah, he's got to figure out his lane, and that is the tricky part, as the, the numbers show. You know, one thing I see in the polling data is that he is most popular among independent voters. The problem is there's not enough true independent voters for him to win in the state of Texas. He would have to pull from somewhere, from Republicans or Democrats. There's some evidence he's actually pulling from a little bit of both, uh, but he, he will either have to decide whether to run as an independent, which is very difficult to do, by the way, and requires something like 84,000 signatures and, and other you know, work along the way, or choose a party and run in the primary. The problem there is that Democrats prefer Beto O'Rourke and Republicans prefer Greg Abbott. So he's in a kind of a tough spot. And uh, in, in, again, in the moderate no man's land that so many uh, people find themselves and I, I should say another interesting number from this poll is that 49 percent of Texans approve of the current j governor's job. So this is really not a, just a rejection of Abbott. This, this really is more a situation of how popular is McConaughey. Absolutely. Yeah, he has a very rare high name ID. It's quite positive. I think if you really get into talking to people about him, even if he's not their first choice, if he's a second choice, um, there's, a, there's a, a level of positivity there, right? I don't think he's done anything really to alienate either side. I just think, you know, for the most part, people are partisans. They have their party and they stick to it. Um, so again, there could be a case to be made that if, if McConaughey were to run, uh, maybe as a Democrat or as a Republican, that he would have to, you know, obviously beat the other candidate in the primary. But there's an argument to be made that once he got the nomination, he would have the support of that party. Um, but yes, the current governor is quite popular. And, you know, one of the issues that's played well for him this election cycle has been border security. And that's something he's talking about all the time. So if you were advising him and saying to him, look, you know, independent is going to be real tough for you in a three way race here. Um, and he said, should I go <laughs> look? And if he were to say to you, look, I don't really care. I'm about, uh, I'm about somewhere in the middle. Should I go for the Republican or should I go for the Democrat? What would you tell him? 
I would say it probably would make more sense for him to go as a Democrat and try and lock up, you know, 95 percent of the Democrat support in the general election, plus enough independents uh, to carry the day. Independents do trend uh, a little Republican in this state. But again, looking at the numbers, I think there are enough there that if he combined the Democratic nomination with, again, maybe 95 percent of Democrats voting for him and he won independents pretty overwhelmingly, which the signs point to the fact that he could, then he could really make a, a real go at this and make this a very competitive race. Super interesting stuff. Uh, and I think you're right that not enough people are taking this seriously. Brendan Steinhauser, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Speaking of politics, a new trend seems to be emerging. Candidates without vast campaign war chests are beating opponents with huge coffers. Maybe money in elections is not as important as everyone is telling us. Up next. Welcome back. In every major election, we hear about how much money this person raised or how much money that one spent, as though that, of course, will be the deciding factor in the result. And for a long time, it seems it did make a lot of difference. Except these days, I'm not convinced that still is true. Maybe, just maybe we're at a point where money doesn't matter as much. Although there weren't you know, that many races this cycle, the ones that were contested only bolstered this sense that in politics, cash might no longer be king. Ed Durr, truck driver from New Jersey, pulled off a big political upset in taking down Steve Sweeney, the president of the state Senate. Sweeney burned more than 300,000 bucks in what turned out to be an unsuccessful defense of his seat. Durr spent $2,300, and that included donuts and coffee for supporters. In Virginia, Republicans had success in a host of down-ballot races on very tight budgets. The GOP flipped seven seats to control the Virginia House chamber, despite being outspent by a two-to-one margin. Go back to 2020, and the examples begin to pile up rapidly. Jamie Harrison spent $130 million, still lost his South Carolina Senate race to Lindsey Graham. Graham spent $33 million less. In Kentucky, Amy McGrath spent $91 million in her failed bid to oust Mitch McConnell. Senate Minority Leader was outspent by more than $25 million, but he won. Go back even further to 2018, Joe Crowley lost his House seat to AOC. She pulled off the victory despite being outspent 18 to 1. The examples go on and on and on. Money still buys certain things in politics. It can buy ad time, it can buy campaign staff, it can you know, even buy credibility, I guess. But at the end of the day, it is starting to feel like maybe money just can't buy votes. Not anymore. Joining us now is David Primo. He is a professor of political science and business administration at the University of Rochester. He's also the co-author of Campaign Finance and American Democracy, What the Public Thinks and Why It Matters. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. You've studied this in depth. You. Does campaign cash really have more of an impact than I'm realizing? You know, this idea that campaign money is what drives election outcomes is one of the uh, myths of American politics that just won't die. Um, yes, it is the case that the more that the that the candidates that spend the most in the elections tend to win, uh, but that's sort of like saying that if you have two cars and one car has more gas in the tank, that that's why uh, one car goes faster than the other. There's so many other factors that determine uh, whether a candidate's going to be victorious in an election. But you know, I have had this theory with no evidence to back it up, just a theory because I'm in the new media world, et cetera, that the rise of new media has really changed the game. And so it allows people to sort of do things in a more grassroots way, the same way that the big media companies don't have the same impact that they used to have because social media, individuals with significant followings, et cetera, hasn't that impacted the, the, the power of political spending? So without a doubt, social media has changed how campaigns are run, uh, but it's not happened as quickly as you might think, uh, at least among sort of the, the some of the major parties uh, before, let's say, Donald Trump came around or uh, Barack Obama came around on the Democratic side. Um, candidates were, were not as quick to adopt social media to run their campaigns as, again, we might think, because uh, campaign consultants, to be honest, had an incentive uh, to stick with the old ways because they made a ton of money <laughs> uh, by encouraging candidates to run TV ads. Uh, so a lot of the way in which, a lot of the reasons why uh, campaigns that use social media have been so successful is I think mm -hmm. campaign consultants 
um, haven't really had an incentive to innovate and keep up. Well, well, that's a great point because, you know, in a lot of these sort of lo more local elections, right, if you flood the airwaves with money, people who watch TV a lot or are in this, they're, they're going to get annoyed, right? They're seeing the same ad again and again and again, and that just can't be impactful. It, you know, this is one of the, it, the amount of money that's actually wasted during campaigns is, is pretty stunning. Right. And that's, that's why we're not actually, we don't actually find in the, in the political science research, we don't find uh, that money is what drives election outcomes. At the margin, we don't find that campaign spending matters a great deal. As long as, you know, except in unusual cases where you win with virtually no spending in some of the examples you just gave, as long as you've got a reasonable amount of money and any candidate that's going to be in a campaign that's viewed as competitive will be able to raise a reasonable amount of money, that's what you need to, to be effective. Then it comes down to whether you have an effective message, whether people are convinced by you as a candidate. All of those Wait, factors. come on. You mean actually policy and like whether they're good candidates matters more than money? Shocking. Oh, what? No, I hear you. Thank, I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, I hope that's the case. I'm out of time, though. Professor Primo, good stuff. Thank you very much. Good luck with the Thank book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming Pleasure out. to be with you. Put it apart! Put it, put it apart! An officer begging the suspect behind the wheel to stop and pull over as he tries to make an arrest and the bad guy decides to floor it. More of the heart-pounding moments captured on police body cam coming up next. Time for our police cam segment showing the dangers officers face every day. Police in Washington, D.C. chased an armed suspect, Natango Robinson, who had threatened another man with a gun. As officers caught up to Robinson, he resisted and got into a Jeep. Officer Christopher Boyle arrived at the scene and tried to restrain the suspect from the back seat. Stop! Stop reaching! Stop reaching! Stop reaching! Stop! That is maddening to watch. Just maddening. Take another look. Robinson starts the Jeep, takes off with Officer Boyle still inside. Boyle demands that Robinson put the Jeep in park 18 times. Keeps saying, don't shoot, don't shoot. Just don't shoot me, don't shoot me. Just put the car in park. Before firing a shot and jumping from the vehicle as Robinson kept driving. Robinson went to a hospital for treatment and was arrested there. He's charged with multiple counts, including felony assault of a police officer while armed, kidnapping, resisting arrest, and reckless driving. Joining me now, Sean Six Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant, my former live PD co-host. All right, Six, uh, you know, watching that is, is really maddening. Talk to us about this from the officer's perspective. Uh, first, you know, I want to commend actually the officers. This all started with a call of a man with a gun. And within five minutes, officers actually spot the suspect, try to take him into, uh, it, they basically tried to detain him. They wanted to put him in handcuffs for officer safety reasons and then pat him down to find out if he had a weapon. That's when the suspect fled, uh, jumped into the car, and as we see, he drives away. You know, personally, I am not a fan of any officer getting into a vehicle with a suspect if there's still keys in the ignition. Um, you know, I've seen too many videos where these type of things happen, where officers have been seriously injured, uh, just as we saw this officer here. But as you pointed out, this is created by the suspect. Um, the officer's in the car. He told them 18 times, loud and clear there on the body cam, to stop the car. And the suspect actually stops it at one point puts his hands up, and then starts driving even faster, which resulted in the officer, uh, you know, firing his weapon and hitting him. 
Yeah, and, and explain to me at that moment, all right, when the officer fires his weapon, what's happening there? You know, the suspect is, he's actually gaining speed. Like I said, initially he's driving pretty slow. You kind of look at the cars that they're passing on the side of the road. The suspect stops, and then he starts to really accelerate. Um, the, the door's still open for the officer. He's obviously in fear of, you know, seriously bodily injury or potential himself being hurt. So whether the suspect crashes, um, they believe he's still armed. From my understanding, they had not removed the firearm from him. So he's in the car potentially with an armed suspect. And, you know, I'm guessing he just felt that his life was in danger or he risked being seriously injured. And this was the only way that he could try to stop the situation. Now, I do want to say the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office there in Washington, D.C., they're obviously going to investigate it and, uh, you know, look for any potential issues. Um, his department will also look at it and they will also actually evaluate his tactics. So if he is justified in the use of deadly force, he may still be, uh, you know, disciplined or trained for better tactics within his own department. Now, two officers already thrown when the suspect had hit the gas. How relevant is that? Um, it, it's another felony that's basically happened. You've got an officer who has used, uh, you know, his vehicle to commit a felony, throwing the office, officers from the car and injuring them. So uh, I've said it before, hey, a, a, a car is nothing but a 2,000 pound bullet. And again, you, numerous officers injured in this because of that. After shooting the suspect, officer jumps from the Jeep onto the road. You know, then he's also now in a tough situation because he's in the middle of the road. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, the initial officers that are behind it, you can actually hear their police police vehicle pursuing the suspect. And rather than continuing after the suspect, uh, at least initially, they stopped to render aid to their fellow officer. Sean Larkin. As always, thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving. Good to see you. Thanks. You too, Dan. Before we go, an extra something to be thankful for this holiday. You know, each week here on the show, we spotlight a missing child and ask for your help to bring them home. Well, in October, we told you about Tegan Doherty of Loudoun County, Tech, Tennessee. We are happy to report that he is now home safe with his parents. Police say it's an ongoing investigation, so we don't have too much to share. We can say that he was found safe on Monday night, and we were absolutely thrilled to hear. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a great holiday. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.